Welcome to Far Out with Faust. I'm Faust Chicho, and today I'm sitting here with John and Ali Denny. A little bit about John. John's a highly specialized performance coach for top-level iconic athletes in a wide variety of competition and sports venues. He's got a bachelor's degree in speech communications from Syracuse and a master's degree in counseling psychology from Pepperdine University. He's also, get this, the founder and inventor of the paddleboard. It's cra crazy, right? You always wondered where that thing came from. I know I did. Um, John has studied and trained with a spectrum of modalities from the HeartMath Institute with mentors and coaches, including Alan Cohen, Deepak Chopra, Ram Das, Dr. Wayne Dyer, and, and the list goes on. He's sitting next to his beautiful daughter, Allie, who is the head coach of Major East Oman Douglas High School's volleyball team in Parkland, Florida, and I believe they're undefeated. Is that is that correct? No, unfortunately, we're not undefeated. Oh, I'm sorry. We were okay. undefeated up until very recently. Right? <laughs> my, my, me and my partner at FIU are undefeated right now. Oh, okay. That's yes. right. Yes. And that, so I'm glad that you're clearing that up for me. So she, she's also an FIU beach volleyball player, which is like basically uh, like a professional volleyball player. I mean, is it, that's about as high uh, as it, It's a but, division one athletics. Yeah. I mean, awesome. we're, yeah, we're division one athletes. That's that's incredible. Um, and that's um, and that's the program, the master's program you're in. Yes. So okay. I just finished my undergrad program in spring of 2020. And then with COVID, they gave everybody a year of eligibility back. Mm -hmm. So I was able to go back and get my master's degree in kinesiology and exercise science. I'm so glad and you play said my that fifth year for me. Kinesiology. <laughs> I, I was kinesiology. Yep. having to say it <laughs> and exercise science. That's amazing. Um, and and Ali is also um, a sexual assault survivor and thriver, which I think is everything. And I adore that that is the way that you describe where you are and, and what you've been through. And we're going to get into a little bit about that and um, some of the way that she's used the techniques that her father has developed to overcome that um, and and transcend it to a place where it's not just something that's you know in in the past but 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 something that she's learned from and has made her stronger and and happier in her life right now and um and also so i, I don't know where to begin with yeah I, i'm so excited to have you guys thank you so much for beaming in i'm i'm so grateful so are we awesome john let's um <laughs> let's start with uh, a little bit about your background and uh and how you ended up you know in 1985 moving to to hollywood and what you know what you were up to and, and what happened in that year well in night in <laughs> i was lost okay really lost in 1984 graduating from college not a clue what i was gonna do i mean ali is so fortunate to have had this sport which has paid for her college and been this focused you know athlete through these last five years I was lost I was like man I hope something finds me because I don't know what I'm going to do and uh so after you know we did the logical thing after graduating from Syracuse University moved straight to Hollywood California to get discovered as being <laughs> a famous actor director producer you know what everyone does right after not knowing what they're going to do and luckily my mother had connections out there and she told us to go to a birthday party on February 2nd, 1985. And it was the 85th birthday of a man named Carol Ryder. He was the astrologer to the stars. He was Ron and Nancy Reagan's astrologer. He was the, astro we walk into this party, there's Cesar Romero and Rudy Valley and all these stars from Hollywood. And we got to meet him that night and over the next few years, well, actually, over, as soon as I met him, I realized he was the happiest, most successful, contented person I have ever met in my life. And I was 23, he was 85. Well, over the next three years, he taught us why and how that was true. And it was basically a lesson in the master's course of metaphysical thinking. How do we take control of our mind and create our reality? Because 
as as above so below it'll be done on earth as it is in heaven and heaven is right inside us so when we started to put these little words together we made a change in our minds and everything has been different you know we were just talking about that but it's been the foundation of my relationship the foundation of my parenting the the tools i use when we go through a trial and tribulation like with ali uh you know it's just it's everything how we think it and is. by we sorry by we he means him and one of his a couple of his friends from syracuse they went over to california together so that just created the foundation for our entire family very cool one, one being john block who he was in the original another thing faust when uh we started going into this journey i wanted to see signs give me a sign that i'm on the right <laughs> track and one of the first things I learned in the first couple months was the party where I met Carol, where Jonathan and I met Carol is on YouTube from 19, from 1985, February 2nd, Carol Ryder's birth, 85th birthday parties on YouTube. And I say, happy birthday. And I, <laughs> and I have no idea who the guy is, whether he's a man or a woman. I'm just, I mean, I'm in this big party with a tie on wondering what the hell I'm doing here. Why everyone's asking me my birthday. <laughs> that is cr crazy and 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 you know we we look for signs and we we're usually walking right by them but then when you realize that they're everywhere you start to uh you start to see them in everything it's uh it's it's a, their perspective changes everything you know but um so i didn't i didn't realize that this was you know that so the 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 foundation for um, what you ended up creating with your uh... so, so we gotta let, let's let's backtrack a little bit. Yeah, I am the creator of nothing. Okay, I I didn't create paddleboarding. However, I kind of I, I was next door neighbors of Laird Hamilton who did, and That's then sure. as soon as he sort of created it, he loved it. My wife loved it, so I was one of the first. I bought three containers of paddle boards and moved my family to the, the East coast of Florida because of paddle boarding. Uh, not a great business idea, but <laughs> it got us all here. And then, uh, so, and, and, and this prayer or this meditation or prayer or, or exercise or whatever you want to call it, you know, Carol used it for at least 40 or 50 years, but he was handed it down. And, you know, we believe this, this, this or forms of this meditation go back millennia yeah that's funny that you say that because you I, I was reading more about what what you do and how you work with people and you know how you work with people who are being putting themselves in very intense situations you know whether that be surfing a freaking 50 foot wave being in the middle of of that or or some of the athletes that you work with in these high pressure scenarios where all the you know all the cameras are on them all eyes are on them and it's time you know it, because uh, you know our bodies can try to get the best of us um and and they have a habit of winning but when you be when you begin to learn techniques and ways to um to be in the middle of that storm and and open this center up, which I think is one of the things that you've really come into um, an awesome practice of. Is that is, is that can you can you talk a little bit about that? You know, it's so. And then I'll go back to what I was saying about this ancient tradition that you mentioned. So, so does our body get in the way, or does our fears and our worries and our ego? go into our body and then create this tension which destroys our performance you know it's sort of a give and take there and uh what what do you think al uh, you know we, we we say how do you find your calm in the eye of the storm and we teach tech we teach a very systematic approach to doing it which is simple and works all the time to, to explain it out yeah i think i think you were you were hitting the nail on the head basically you know it's it's this process of finding your calm in the eye of the storm. And there's always external variables, especially as athletes, especially as, you know, people who are going through trauma, 
there's, it's easy to let your thoughts control you, but having the tools to not let them control you is, I mean, it's the best medicine that you can ask for. And that's how we got through trials and tribulations when there's stressful times, when there's uncertainties, it's finding that way to, you know, to, to get through those without just giving up or, you know, or going through, you know, finding those reactions of or become bad reactions. Right. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and exactly. And I saw, I saw Ali using these skills yesterday in both of those game threes, but how do we take our mind off of the problem and bring it back to ourselves? So how do we focus correctly? How do we breathe correctly to calm our heart and nervous system? And then how do we think the right thought? You know, Ali who said, you know, dad, I just kept saying to myself, I am the best volleyball player on this court right now. Pro show it to everyone, you know, and she would actually use affirmations in the middle of the game. Mm -hmm. And recently we've been, I've been conversing with him, with my dad about how I'm understanding how powerful thoughts are. So this, I, this concept that thoughts are things, it is so real. <laughs> it is so powerful. You know, if I'm claiming I'm sick, okay. Then my body alley is going to be, going to be sick because my I am is clouded by that ego of Allie. Mm -hmm. But if I'm saying I am perfect health, I am happy. I am energetic and, you know, finding, getting through these like mental um, blocks of external variables, pressures, things that I may feel during a volleyball game. No, I am the smartest person on this court. I am the be the most controlled on this court and it's immediate. Granted, it takes practice and you do need to have that patience because mm -hmm. it's not going to click right away, but you're going to have that magic moment of when it does. And yesterday it did for me. So yesterday being in our tournament. And so I was playing against people I knew, people that were similar style of players to me. And so, but what set me apart from them? My mental game, my, I was able to be in control of my emotions the entire time no matter what the score was, no matter what was happening, you know, people um, bantering outside the court, different things like that. But I, no matter what, I was in control the entire time. And that's what this practice does. These thoughts are things. And it's amazing yeah. to see that connection. It's, it's amazing to hear you talk about it, you know, and I, you know, I bring uh, particularly, you know, I, I love I love using my body, and I, I and I got into boxing over the last six seven years pretty heavily, and that I I I, just, I love everything about it. I've always loved the sport, but you know the 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 challenge of it, the movements of it, but also you know when you get in front of someone and you know that you know you know in your mind that you are you're in a, you're in a sport and that you're not trying to hurt anyone and you're not in a fight right you know that intelligently you know that <laughs> but when someone punches you in the head you know you're, <laughs> all your body knows is you're in a fight you know <laughs> you better get your shit together you know here's all here's all the adrenaline here's that everything you need you know defend yourself and and kill that mother you know and so you know you got to it's a constant re reacclimation it's a little bit like going on stage as an actor you know your body is like oh my god what well, you know that all these crazy things start to happen and you have to come back into your body and and be in the <laughs> try to take control of that of that storm um and so it's so amazing to hear you talk about it, ali and how you used it in real time because that's the biggest thing about you know we can meditate and we can we can gain mastery of ourselves with our eyes closed until the cows come home. But then if we're going to get in the car and go and get stuck in traffic and start road raging, then what have we, you know, what are, what are we accomplishing? We have to be able to practice it. Right. Mm -hmm. And, and to hear you talk about how you do it is it, it's awesome. And, and that's why, that's why, you know, I'm learning about all John is doing with his techniques and the people he's working with and, and, 
John, you're working with some pretty high level dudes um, as, as far as athletes go, right? I mean, you want to talk a little bit about how you work with them? I mean, if you want to say who, I don't know if you can say who you're working with. But. Well, I'm really fortunate. You know, it's just, it's so funny. Like right now, uh, uh, one of our America's best snowboarders, I, we just talked to him in Switzerland last night. On the way home from your game, we talked to Lion, Lion Farrell. And he's in this huge snowboard competition in Europe today. And, uh, you know, I work with, with uh, um, these great skateboarders, Zion, right? I work with just these two girls, uh, Nikki and Lara, Lara Dahlman. She just made the uh, Olympics in a, in a 470 sailing class. So, but, you know, it doesn't matter what the sport is and it doesn't really matter what the problem is the, the 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 answer is always the same and the answer comes back to three things it comes back to love loving what you're doing and really loving yourself but loving what you're doing secondly gratitude being grateful to have the ability to do what you're doing and then third is forgiveness being able to take full accountability for everything you do good right and indifferent you know, you take full accountability for all the bad stuff that happens to you. You take full accountability for all the good stuff. Uh, you know, I say it all the time. Uh, for every bad thing that happens to me, I probably have 10 good things happening to me. So I'll claim it. Hey, uh, you know, I'm sorry. I, whatever I did to cause that, I am sorry. And, you know, when you go to this level of accountability, which is not easy, you know, life changes. But it, it, when you realize that, you know, Tell Ali, tell them about my shirt. <laughs> so we have shirts that say everything is my fault. And the, the reactions <laughs> that we get from them are just hilarious. You know, some people are like, that's fantastic. Other people are like, why would you say that? <laughs> yeah. I want a shirt like that. <laughs> you, blaming is, I'm convinced something that's very taught I'm, I'm i'm from a family of blamers they're not going to hear this podcast anyway but they should they know they're blamers if they don't my god everything is someone else's fault for in my family you know this is i mean everything from the reason why i was late to you know why why there's dinner was not was burned nothing is anyone's fault in my family and so i'm trying to teach my children how you know not to blame not to point the finger you know because it's it is a very childlike thing to do it's natural to them to do it um but i'm starting from a young age to you know so they don't have to deal with what i had to deal with to kind of recondition myself stop blaming everyone for everything that happens to me you know well ali and i in our coaching we speak that we t we teach that lesson and i was taught a long time ago when you point your finger at someone you have three fingers pointed back at you and so generally when you really don't like someone in someone else or you're judging someone at some level if you take a look in the mirror chances are you have that trait within you and it's something that you really don't like inside you that you see in that other person now it may be magnified and you're like well i'm not that bad but maybe not but you're that you have it in you at some level or it wouldn't bother you you That's know true. or you <laughs> and you wouldn't be in the relationship that you were with that person you know i mean right. it didn't appear out of nowhere i always tell my friends who are going through divorces and 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 rocky marriages, you know and, and the, especially my guy friends they're everything is their their <laughs> the spouse's fault everything is their wife's fault i'm like dude listen that's the first thing that you have you, it's not going to get better it's not going to get any better until you take responsibility for your half of the deal. It's not oh. just her fault, man. You know what I mean? Like you can't, Men. can't continue to think this. This is like oblivious. This is, and it's not true. I'm like, you know, you, everything that you guys have created is, is a reciprocal thing, you know, and it's so hard to get dudes to, to get guys <laughs> to really to, you know, and well, then first thing they respond is, yeah, but she did. I'm like, no, 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 uh, no, no, no. <laughs> you, you know, what, what you're talking about right now is the spiritual awakening. It is the spiritual awakening as far as relationships go. And we all have the way that you, the, the best 
cure for any relationship is ho ho pono pono. I love you. Thank you. I am sorry. Please forgive me. And you take those four thoughts over and over. You win every argument and you take 100% accountability and responsibility. I, I am sorry for what happened to you. I am sorry for whatever I did that happened to you. I'm sorry for what I did to cause you to do what you did. I mean, at the highest levels, you know, it's crazy, but it's- Yeah, it's really, it's really amazing too, because, you know, m- mom and dad are going on 27 years of an amazing, successful marriage. The journeys that we've all been on, you know, like our childhood, my brother and I grew up on Maui And then we got to travel to Fiji. We got to travel to all these amazing, amazing places. And when I tell people about the way that I grew up, they're like, whoa, you're so lucky. And I'm like, yeah, but my parents worked for it. And that's the foundation of everything is love, like he said before. And Ho'oponopono has helped us through the hardest things that we've ever had had to be through, had to go through. And it's really just how, how can you have a happy marriage? They wake up laughing. You know, you don't, you don't hear about a 27 year marriage and they wake up laughing every day all the time. That that's just because of your dogs that you left. in. (laughs) Oh yeah. That's true. (laughs) That's so funny because I was about to say, I woke up laughing this morning too, but it was because my sheep doodle climbed in bed with me and was licking my ear. (laughs) Well, well, so, somehow Faust Alley thought it would be a good idea last year if she bought two little baby dachshunds and she brought the them back. Best idea to, ever. <laughs> she, she brought them back to her apartment and the, the landlord was like, you're not allowed to have dogs on your lease. And Allie's like, it says it on your lease. And, you know, well, long story short, about four months later, they returned, they, they came up to Jupiter and we've been uh, blessed with them ever since. Oh man, just when you thought you had a little bit of a break. Like, no, here's two dogs to take care of. <laughs> I don't like I don't like to do things the easy way. <laughs> I hear you. I hear you. There's a lot to be gained from meeting challenges. <laughs> That's so funny. Um, you know, I wanted to, to talk to you a little bit about because I John, I've I've been Hunter introduced me to the Harmony uh website and he's like, Yeah, just sign just sign in with my credentials and uh and I didn't even realize it was, it's, John, it, I apologize for that. Uh, uh, it was just John, John Block gave me those things. And uh, I just want him to try it before he got it. Anyway, yeah. Who, who cares? It's free. Well, I mean, that's what I mean. Matter. I was about to say it's, it's <laughs> that was my point. That was my, my entire point was. Anyway, uh, signing uh, up. <laughs> so, so I've been, I've been using the, the website and, I didn't know. I didn't know it was free, John. I thought Before because Hunter gave me the credentials. I'm sure, you get back into uh, Jaws and a little bit of the uh, strap crew and stuff, just because, just for my own edification. <laughs> okay. Um, oh yeah, we'll, we'll we'll get. Wait, you mean the surfing and the? Yeah, we'll get back to that. Let's go. Okay. go. Um, so, John, I was saying, uh, I didn't I didn't realize that it was that it was free. Um, I've been signing in every day with Hunter's credentials and and. You know, I'm, I'm always sending him like, a, I'm like, oh, try the, you know, I, I'm a student of Dr. Joe Dispenza's. I don't know if you've ever heard of uh, Dr. Joe. Uh, he we, we're very, we're very consistent in our message, me and Joe. Yeah. Uh, and, and so I'm like, oh, Hunter, you got to try this. And he's like, check this out. You know, he's like, dude, this is, it's 15 minutes. And so I, as soon as I did it, I was, I, I, I loved it, you know, and so now I've been doing it all, almost every day and. You know, there are some days it's funny then you come on and you you have like a little message before the meditation. And I swear on those days you sa- you save my ass, man. Like I was like crazy shit had happened to me. Like like a kind of drama that is really not not prevalent in my life at all anymore. It just kind of happened on that day. And then you come on and you say something like, you know, look, you know, we we give up the fight there there is no fight when you're right when you know when you know that you're not guilty you have no reason to to fight you know that you can be assured in that and i was like man it was like 
so many times you've said exactly what I needed to hear and I've just like put me right into this great meditation that you guys do every day. And so can you talk a little bit about how, how that came about this daily um, gift that you give the world? So, okay. About, about seven or eight years ago, I, I, I just had a feeling in my heart, my, my calling in life. I so saw I was about 50, three or four, just over 50 years old. And I was like, my, and I think I knew it before that, but my calling is the perpetuation of this exercise. It, it's me and a bunch of 90 year olds that do it right now. But I, I just feel that it's something I really need to put out there. And we went down a hundred different roads and nothing worked. And then on Dece about December 1st, 2016, my friend, a mentor of mine, Coach Dan, he gave me a challenge and he said, do you think you can do your medit the harmony every day for a year on Facebook Live? And we just had learned about Facebook Live. It was January, 2017. And for one year, sometimes it took me four takes to get it done. I did it every day for a year, no matter where I was. And we watched... We were taking, and, and at the same time this year, I started recording harmonies for Allie's volleyball team in South Carolina for the Gamecocks. And that was the same year. And that year, they made the national championship. My wife got the best job of her life. I lost 25 pounds and quit drinking tequila without even trying. Like, it just... The, the, everything changed that year. And then I was like, okay, now we're proving, we're really proving this works. It's no longer say as I do, as I say, it's, you know, do as I do. And that level of commitment went into level two, three, and four. Like today, I, I told you, I just looked it up for fun. Today is day 1,599 of me doing at least once a day, every day. And that has made... You know, and most people don't, most people are never going to do that. It worked great doing it once or twice a week. It worked great doing it once every two weeks. Yeah, but yeah. if you want to supercharge this stuff, you need to make it, you need to make it. When they say have a daily practice, they don't get around. You need a daily <clears throat> practice. Yeah. I was, re I, I love that. I, I was reading that about on your, on the website and, you know, what it means to have, I was like, I got to talk to John about what it means to have a daily practice. Um, because I think it's very important, you know, and I, and, and I, and I, I, I don't miss a day. I, maybe I've missed a day, you know, this year, maybe two days, um, out of the whole year, maybe last year was, I mean, last year was a crazy year. So I, I spent, I would have these odd, you know, hours of spent in, in meditation and then yeah, because of the pandemic and everything, it was it was a wild ride. But but um, it's it it become it's like we you you talk a lot about flow um, and and being when you're in the flow of your life, you know. I always tell people it's like that's it goes row 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 your boat gently down the stream, you know. And when you're when you're rowing down the stream, it's easier if, when you, if your boat gets turned around, you know, and you're. All of a sudden, you find things to be a struggle. It probably means that you're trying to row upstream, you know. And um, this is kind of a simple thing, kind of a litmus test to remember what you're doing and how you're doing it. But you know, everything changed for me when I when I really became a daily practitioner of meditation, and especially meditation like yours that has wonderful qualities like you know um, intention. Um, affirmation these things are powerful they're life-changing they have profound effect on everything in your life um, I, I, I've experienced that and I know you've been telling us about it I want, I, I want Allie to talk to this point about when it becomes a, a daily meditation but what Carol explained to me is we are transformed by the renewal of the mind OK, and and when this sort of clicks, you know, this this spiritual awakening and that that the thoughts that you think become your reality, that's to me, that's the spiritual awakening. When I think it. it it's going to happen, you know, if I spot it, I got it. so when we when we think a thought and it starts to happen, that's really um, 
and, and we have that awakening, then that makes us, it, it makes it so much more important. So, and then for some reason, human beings are default to negative. So if we don't renew our mind intentionally into these thoughts of health, harmony, gratitude, forgiveness, unfortunately, we renew our mind into the problems we had yesterday and or whatever our problem du jour is, so to speak. <laughs> One of the greatest lessons that dad has taught me this year um, is I am not at peace, so I must be making a bad decision. And it may not be a decision that is right in front of your face. It could be something that, you know, that could, that have, that had happened last week or something that is just kind of doesn't seem like a big deal, but it actually is a big deal. And that has really resonated with me in the harmony and okay, I am not at peace. You know, I'm 23. So I'm going through these, I'm finishing a master's degree. I'm finishing being a college athlete. I got to start thinking about where I'm going to be in life in the next few months. And these decisions that I'm making are very important, but having these affirmations and this daily meditation and this daily thing that I do every day has been life-changing because it's like, there there's it's so easy to be stressed about life and the physical world there's it's so easy to be stressed about it but when you take control and you understand that you are in control and it this is only the your own perception of life things get a lot easier and things also get a lot more fun you know we wake up and we're having fun every day no matter what because we understand this concept of the world and this way of thinking about the world. And yeah, we still go through the things that humans go through, but we see things from a, a totally different level and keeping those, those thoughts in mind and that, okay, this, you are in control of what you want to do. And the meditation and the harmony makes it, it's only 15 minutes of the day and you can do it whenever you need it. Mm -hmm. So uh, living, Ali's describing living in this world, but not of this world. The, uh, <laughs> the, I get confused sometimes. No, that's no, I, I love that. It, so in year three of this journey of meditation, I became a minister of the course in miracles. Ah, and I, I did a, a, so year three, I added a daily study of the course in miracles onto my harmony exercise. And one of the things that made me engage in that study was that thought Ali's talking about. I'm not at peace. Mm -hmm. I must be making a wrong decision. I made this decision myself and I want to be at peace and I can choose otherwise. And so I don't even really have to know why I'm not at peace. I just have to know I want to be at peace and know the thoughts I have to choose to be at peace again love gratitude and forgiveness so i'm sorry i'm not at peace and whatever i've done to create this situation that i'm not at peace please forgive me thank you that i can be at peace i love being at peace and i am at peace so be it and so we come back to peace and you know that's the application of these the, these metaphysical principles and how it works yeah and what ali was saying you know ali you were talking about it's taking control, but just for everyone who's listening, I think that it's worth noting that it's not, you know, it's, that doesn't mean becoming obsessed with everything that you cannot control. It, it you know, like we, we have a tendency to, I, I know I always have to kind of check myself and I think a lot of people, you know, would like to control the exterior of their world to a degree that that they can then then they can feel more comfortable just being but i think that what you're talking about and how it differs from from what a, a typical um statement of like you know like we need to take control is there's a there's a the paradox of that is there's a surrender involved and and so you get to this point where you can you can you have such control o over your this amazing 
you know, technology mechanism that we have on this planet, but also what's underneath that, what's creating that, you know, your soul. And, and you can really kind of um, trust that these things, and that's when things really just start to open up for you and, and solutions and, and just come as faster than the problems. You know, it's like you just turn around and it's there, you know, like it's, things are literally, fl you know, flying down the street that it, exactly what you need. You know, like I remember the other day, my dog pooped. I reached for a bag. There was none. I was like, damn it. And literally the wind blew a bag, a pl an empty plastic bag right into my hand. And I was like, well, thank you. That <laughs> I'm like standing in the middle of First Avenue. I'm the only one on there. I'm like, no one even saw it, man. That's, oh, well, you know, <laughs> it was, but it was, but it's crazy. It was such a, a metaphor for when you're feeling in flow and you're, ju when you're just being and then you, and you, you know, things are at peace. These kind of synchronicities happen to you. I mean, and I think that's what you're talking about, Ali. Am I right? Or please correct me if I'm not. No, I, I definitely think you're right. Um, sometimes it's hard because I, I can get caught up in the real world and caught up in things that, you know, happen to me. And I've come to understand that, like, nothing happens to me things are happening for me. And another big lesson that I'm learning daily is that what dad preaches is we don't get what we want. We get what we believe. And the world and the universe is going to give us what we believe. So even if we think that we want one thing, that might not be right for us, but I believe that I need this. And the universe will tell me and give it to me when I'm ready for it. And so really understanding that, you know, everything is going to work out in the end and everything is going to be in the flow as we take these daily practices and we do this daily affirmation, this daily right action, these, these things that we're creating, it's just, it changes everything. It does change everything, um, like consistency. It's like we, it's like we were talking about John about the that video that I posted that you checked out about repetition and and what a, an amazing capacity it has to to program or reprogram, you know, this the thought process that we have, the belief systems that we're that we're all. Because we all have them. I mean, you're, you know, you're you're walking around with them. You can't. You. I mean, you can only disassociate from this personality. You know, your identity so much because you have a driver's license and you need it to go, you know, anywhere. So, I I, I always laugh at that. I I marvel at that because it's so funny to think that you know we have we're so wrapped up in our personalities so often. You know, and I and one thing that this pandemic and everything has given given me a chance to do is really kind of disassociate from putting value in this you know personality and identity career you know like these things are they're 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 just what we what we have going on for fun here and now you know and it, and it's li it's it's given me a lot of liberty and peace to be able to kind of step back from that and in, and in, and enjoy that but um so john I know we can't we can't go much farther without <laughs> returning to Laird Hamilton and uh, and and because <laughs> so, I, I I know my phone's going to start buzzing. But so I, I, okay, I, so I, you know, there's two great stories about this because we're talking about being in control, and uh, you know, Allie, Allie, who was your first babysitter? You know, Laird Hamilton. <laughs> we tell this story because uh, Laird was very kind to us and brought us over to Kauai and we went on a helicopter ride and during that helicopter ride we left Allie who was not even I don't know not even six months old yet we left her with Laird she threw up all over him <laughs> and we had this incredible experience you know flying up into the mountains of Kauai and then um but later on we, you know he's he's someone who has you know, you face these situations where you really have very little control of anything except your inner self. And so 
for a long time, I was sort of the uh, helper to these guys as they go up and pioneer um, Jaws and they'd be riding the biggest waves in the world and no one really understood the consequences of what was going to happen. And early on in about 2000 is when I learned these heart math techniques and how to really self-regulate and calm the heart, proper breathing. I'd been medit I'd been doing the harmony for years, but I didn't even understand what the 10 count breathing did. I'd been doing yoga for years and I didn't understand what the Anjaya breath was, but boy, I could make it through an hour of yoga class sweating my butt off, right? But I didn't get it on that next level. And then when I learned the heart math and the harmony and the yoga, suddenly there was this awakening. And that's what we're all talking about. That's what we all need to have is this aha moment. And I started realizing the power, you know, basically mentally, physically, and spiritually, and emotionally, how we can control and direct ourselves. So I remember we used to go, we'd all get on our jet skis and head up towards Jaws. And there was, you'd go up these, you know, these huge waves. It's basically open ocean jet ski riding. And Dave and Laird would look over at me and I'd be on my ski and they'd come over like, hey, John, you know, you doing your breathing? You doing your breathing exercises? And, you know, they could tell I was doing it only because they knew it. But I, I think it's something that helped all of them. You know, Dave Kalama loved the heart rate variability training. And, you know, they, they all saw the power in proper breathing proper focus. As you can see now, Laird and Gabby, and Gabby's a big inspiration to, to Ali in her volleyball career. They have the XPT motivation thing that they do on weekends. And they just, they talk about these same skills, these same self-regulation skills. They don't quite take it to the harmony level of spirituality, but they talk about all the same physical and mental skills that we talk about all the time. So I think it's, you know, the little doors have opened for everybody along the way, but remaining calm, I think, under situations where you have very little control. And that that really is life in general. We have so much less control than we think we do. And all those uh, physical things that we attach on to mm -hmm. try to control end up making us crazy after a while. Or even worse, <laughs> I, have, I have people in my family who seem to they, they're a collector of things. They have lots of cars and houses and this and that. And my brother-in-law, who's a very successful man, came to me one day. He goes, you know, John, at one point, you just realize you don't own anything. All this stuff just owns you. And I was like, oh, thank God for my F-150. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You, you know, what you're saying, John, is so incredible because first off, we heard... Uh, Ali talk about the application of it right off the bat and um, you know it, it really does date back thousands of years you know what I I learned about the ancient mystery schools dating back to Egypt and beyond and, and one of the, the the way they worked with their initiates um, you know has has been has come through a lot of different um, channels and and it's written written down and translated but it's not something that you you hear a, a lot about but one of the things that they they did specifically in the in in the ancient mystery schools in Egypt was they had their initiates go through a, a, pro, a part of the program and in, in order to get to the the next level and, and kind of graduate was they had to overcome their fear you know and they but they would put them in these scenarios where they would show like that you know they showed how the 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 cavern was diagrammed and they would, they would have to swim underneath all these crocodiles um, which they were told, you know, were hungry. They didn't know that the crocodiles had been fed and that they weren't, they were totally kind of gorged and that they were safe. But speaking of crocodiles, my dog's going to start scratching on the door <laughs> like crazy. So if you hear a scratching noise, <laughs> she's crying. Sorry. Um, I don't know if you guys can hear that or not, but, um, and, and, and so they didn't, they would come, they didn't know what they were going into but they would come out and they would just see these tremendous Nile crocodiles and that the only way out was through through the opposite end which you could really only get to with a calm heart 
you know, you had to be able to hold your breath and make it there. And, and, and so not many of them would make it on their first try, but they couldn't, you know, this challenge of being open hearted in the face of fear dates back, you know, way back. And it's so integral, I think, to an important part of, you know, truly awakening and truly coming into an awareness of who and what you are and, and all of its, you know, beauty and splendor. So it's it's so cool to see, like, I see you teaching this and, and, and I don't know how much awareness you have, how ancient this tradition is, and but it's like you're like a modern day messenger of it and it's just so cool to see the way it comes about and modern technology and you know and, and humans and it's like it's the same challenge it's the same message the same teaching but to see how how you do it it's just so cool man it's awesome well we couldn't be more grateful to have sort of you know it's, it's all divine planning uh, you know uh, we talk about it all the time we don't even know how we've been given this but i love i love the peer, I've never seen them. And if you ever want to take a trip, I don't care how dangerous it is. I'll go with you. If you want to face your dangers going to Egypt tomorrow, I want to see those pyramids. And anybody who, you know, like I'll get a little bit crazy here, but Carol explained to me that the man who taught the harmony exercise to him was a master master. Okay. And he could remove he could remove gravity from things. He could do things that we don't even understand. Now, when I, when I got that in my mind, you know, anybody who doesn't think that the Egyptians were a hell of a lot more advanced than us is crazy. And, you know, they moved those stones on way. Nobody dragged those stones anywhere, you know, yeah. and they were, they were formed by things we know nothing about. And, and that those, pyramids were set in places by forces we know nothing about exactly. however those forces were used and channeled through humans through the egyptians and it was a divine you know they were really locked into the forces of the universe into god or whatever you want to call the force of love this force of complete perfect creation and they knew how to do it you know, no one put two million stones in place in 20 years. That's insane. No. And, you know, and then to really, it's almost sad where we have evolved now as a society, you know, basically we're going to, th this particular society is probably going to wipe itself out and they're going to get another chance, but the world's not ending. It's going to keep regenerating because it's only going in one direction. It's going in the perfect unfoldment. You can get in synchronicity or you can get out of it either one you want yeah yeah and yeah. the harmony and the harmony exercise scientifically gets us in alignment it it it, it renews the mind it, it the harmony tone the relaxation uh, the the breathing get us into the vibration of nature the perfect vibration of health the perfect vibration of harmony and peace, the perfect vibration of abundant supply. And when those things happen, then it becomes our earthly reality. And that's what we're seeing over and over. And yes, you know, Ali went through some, we all do, we all go through trials and tribulations. We've been through, you know, Ali went through the rape. We've been through a suit. My brother's wife committed suicide last year during COVID. We've been through you know, over and over, we've been through traumas and traumas. However, these principles have held our nuclear family together and in sanity through life's biggest curveballs, honestly. Yeah, I'm so sorry to hear about your, about the last year and the, the, the suicide. Um, and, and that brings me to what I wanted to talk about next, Ali, uh, uh, regarding what happened to you and how you dealt with it, but you know, whatever you're comfortable uh, talking about and, and, and just how you got through it, because I, you know, I don't, I don't, there, I don't know a lot of women who haven't had some kind of um, trauma involving this. I don't know if it's to the degree that you have, but, you know, trauma in general is something that we are faced with as a human being on this planet right now. 
this this is what we you know i believe this is what we chose to to come here and do and so there's a lot to be learned from someone who has you know found a way to do it in a way that and they are thriving i love the word that you use you know in your description cuz you can you can get through it you can survive it but <laughs> Some people have a very difficult time finding, you know, um, a place with themselves where they can thrive, you know, where they can be okay again. And, and so I want to hear about how you did that and how you, your father, you know, you used his techniques and tell me all about it. Sure. Yeah. So um, the word thriving, that was actually dad's word for me. Um, I didn't, I didn't pick that out myself, but I guess you could say I am thriving. So in February of 2017, I was raped by a friend of mine. Unfortunately, he was very, very drunk, um, decided to come into my room one night. And the next thing I knew, it was it was about 4.30, 4.45 in the morning, waking up to a Sunday morning. Um, and I woke up to him taking my clothes off and he was on top of me and trying to um, you know, have sex with me. And I was telling him, get off me, what are you doing? You know, and he was so just hammered that he was not comprehending anything I was saying. So that was the weekend before my first uh, college beach volleyball match. And I was in the starting lineup, I was, um, in the top two seeds, getting ready to be on this team that was ready to get to the next level, basically. And my recruiting class, my freshman recru recruiting class, five of us were starters. And so we were a very young team, but we were a very determined team. And the day after I was raped, I started having anxiety attacks. And I was like, okay, I didn't really know, we had gone through seminars, you have to take some, some classes and some courses about things that happened. But when it happens to you, it doesn't really feel real. You're like, okay, I said no, but he didn't listen. Does that mean that I was raped? And, and then you start to question yourself like, okay, this was my fault. I didn't lock the door. Like, I was going through different things of blaming myself. I, I didn't, I was blaming him. I was blamed. I didn't really know what to do. So I started with these anxiety attacks and, and these panic attacks. It happened in my bedroom. So in, in my dorm up at South Carolina. And so going to sleep was really hard. Um, driving was really hard. Going to class was really hard. And every time I left my room, I would start to kind of freak out, start, I was nervous. Was I going to run into him in the elevator? What is, was I going to run into him at the student athlete cafeteria? So when I had the panic, when I had a panic attack at practice, uh, about a week later, my coach said, okay, what's going on? Are you okay? And I just said, you know, I don't know. I don't, I think something bad happened to me, but I don't know. I, I'm not sure. Now, before all of this was happening, or well, during the panic attacks, I just kept saying to myself, okay, I'm in control. I, I forgive you. I forgive you for what happened. I forgive you. I'm sorry. Please forgive me. I love you. Thank you. And it would take about five to 10 minutes for me to calm myself down um, using Ho'oponopono and using the harmony because <clears throat> at that point, I didn't want to tell anybody. And I was so embarrassed that I was like, okay, this is the only tool that I have right now. How am I going to get through this by myself? And it eventually it got to the point where I couldn't get through it by myself because I became just so panicked all the time and nothing had happened, had happened to him yet. So when I started the process of reporting it and telling you know telling the authority not the authorities but the school authorities and things the people that I ended up going through um I was still focused on 
my own thoughts. And I would feel myself start to think about like, okay, I would think about that night. I would think about what happened, where I was going, um, different things like that. And I was like, okay, Allie, you just have to, you just have to breathe. You have to use the tools that you have. And I'm so fortunate that when I was, I think five years old, six years old, that's when my dad learned about the harm or learned about heart rate variability and, and heart math. And I had that tool. I had that reset breath that, okay, I know I'm in control of my heart and I know I'm in control of my thoughts. When you're in an emotional state like that, it's very difficult to take those negative thoughts away. But like he says, you don't stop thinking negatively. You start thinking positively. So those positive thoughts for me were, thank you. I love you. I'm sorry. Please forgive me. And for minutes on end, I would just repeat those four thoughts and I would be hyperventilating. I would be crying. I would be in an emotional state, but I would, but I would try to be patient with myself. And I would, and I just reset those four thoughts over and over and over again. And I tried to implement the harmony as much as I could. And so I was 19 years old battling this and I was like okay you know why why would he do this you know I was questioning a lot of things and so I'm su- when I started going to therapy they put me on lorazepam mm. and a very low dose but I was like okay I need I need to take this now I have a lot of family members who have struggled with addiction and I have cousins who have struggled with pills alcohol um Benzo, different things that's like a that. benzo too right I think so. Yeah. Yeah. And so I didn't want to tell my parents that, you know, I I didn't know how to communicate with really anybody with what, what I was feeling because you go through those stages of grief at the end of the day, I'm, I'm going through the anger. I'm going through the, the sadness. I'm going through the blame. I was going through all these things. And at the same time, I had to keep my grades up. I had to keep performing on the volleyball court and I had to keep being a leader on my volleyball team. And so there was a lot going on and it was a really long two years because I was also going to the trial. I was also going, you know, trying to figure out how was I going to get through this? And then I was like, I hate being outside of Florida. I want to go back home. I want, you know, all I wanted to do was go home. So I would call my dad and I'd be like, dad, I just, I just really want to go home. And so finally, when I told them, um, you know, my mom's, my mom's reaction was, well, we need to go, we need to, we need to ruin his life. We need to go, you know, tell everybody, we need to go tell the police. We need to go call his mom. And I was like, I know mom, like I, I, I'm pissed too. I get it. And then my dad's reaction, he's, as you can tell, he's very even keel. He's very mm-hmm. peaceful. He's like, you know what? I'm so sorry that this happened to you, but I love you and I'm here for you. And so I'm, I'm very lucky that it wasn't violent. You know, I wasn't, I wasn't physically really hurt. I was just, my vulnerability was taken away from me and my trust was taken away from me. So I had to battle through those things, but I'm also very, very fortunate and so grateful that I had these tools, that I had the harmony, that I had Ho'oponopono. And I had this, like we said, when we were young, like, like we said, that fundamentals, those fundamentals of, okay, this, I already understand this way of thinking. Mm -hmm. This is the hardest thing I've ever been through so far. And I've recovered from it probably a lot faster than most women. Can you imagine it? I mean, can you imagine having experienced that and not having had those tools to deal with it? I would be I would be a drug addict. I mean, I mean, just imagine where that puts you and, and, and I, I just think about how common that is, and you know, then you, then you, you know, you start the, the pharmaceuticals, and and look, pharmaceuticals have their place, you know, but but when we're dealing with some of these things, they're kind of a, they're like an anesthesia, you know, they're just one more anesthesia instead of exactly dealing with what you need to deal with. So, it's so great that you had the tools that you had, and I and I. I 
I can sense and imagine how um, vulnerable it, it is still is for you to touch in on this subject and, and tell the story. And, and I thank you for your courage in doing that for, for, for me and for people who are listening, you know, who um, probably many of whom have had some kind of similar experience. And, um, you know, I don't, I, I understand your dad added the word thriving to, um, to the sentence, but, um, it's, it, it seems accurate to me when I learn about you and see everything you're doing. So I, 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 um, I, I hope that it's cool with you that he did that. Um, and that it is. <laughs> you are, you're embracing it because it seems like you are thriving, uh, especially for Thank your you. age, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's an amazing thing, you know, and, um, yeah, it's, it's huge. And John, I mean, I'm trying to imagine, man. And one of the, one of the things that I want to ask you about is like, man, I mean, I have two sons. I don't have, I don't, I, I was not blessed with a daughter. Um, but it's hard, it's hard for me to imagine your position, you know, and, and, and so I would love to ask you how you got over it, holding on to, because I, I mean, like, I can't imagine the the anger and resentment and the, the kind of, you know. You know, I mean, I, I mean, I don't even know where to start on this one, because yes, it was a very emotional thing, but at the same time, you know, we knew we knew she wasn't dead, you know, so you sort of you sort of come at things. And then, you know, you come in a little bit thing. So no, I'm not the kind of father who's like, you know, get me a gun. I'm going to go kill the, the son of a bitch. You know, that's just, that's just, that just doesn't cure anything, you know, and it doesn't cure anything at the highest levels. That just, okay. it just makes it worse, you know? So, and, you know, and I mean, you know, I, I was kind of like Allie at first. I'm like, okay, well, was Allie drunk, you know? So I, I didn't want to, skewer the guy right away but right. then later later on when i heard the whole story and that he was the down and out guilty party then to see how it was dealt with with the athletic department and everything else was horrendous yeah ali had one advocate the whole the whole rest of the athletic two, department two. well the rest two, of the two. athletic department was like Okay, well, how do how do we protect both athletes? Yeah, you know, and Allie's like, what do you mean? And her, you know, her lady was like, both athletes. He's a rapist. We're yeah. not we're not protecting him. Yeah. And then the worst thing, Faust, is she had to deal with it. He was he was supposed to be off of that campus for the next three years or something. Yeah. The next year. Well, she gets back sophomore year. We make her go back which she didn't want to go back, but we're like, you're going back because this guy's not going to ruin your dream. Right. And with, within a week, she has anxiety attacks and, and he's in her dorm. Oh my God. And oh my so God. she had to, so they, week one, she has to go back to the lady from last year and start all over and get the kid arrested again. And it wow. was like, so sophomore year started worse than freshman year. <laughs> However, that at the same time, that whole team made the national championship twice wow. as a team that had no business going to the national championship. I mean, they both they lost first round both years, but they made it to the elite eight, mm -hmm. you know, and, and and that was just unbelievable. And that team was a meditating team. They mm -hmm. did he they did headspace and the harmony every week. I I, I recorded yeah. over forty harmonies for that team, and it was. Uh, you know, I, I'm still grateful for that, but the way that they handled Allie's crisis was, you know, it was. Mm. It just goes to show you those SEC schools, or those big, those big schools. They don't really care about the individual; they care about the oh yeah, the bigger picture. You know, isn't that more clear than ever with what's come out over the last five five years? You know, it's like it's it's it's, it, it's crazy how much stock that that is put into these superficial notions and not the individual well-being of the of, of our of our young people in general you know everything's about saving making you know saving face and keeping the reputation and god forbid you know anything threatens the reputation of the school that's the oh. 
you know, and I understand it's a, it's a, it's a tightrope to walk, but at the same time, you're a human being, you know, just, just make sure that that's the priority humanity, yeah. you, you know, I mean, it's simple, but, um, yeah, man, it's a, it's a, it's incredible. And so the, like, I, I wanted to go back to the, the, you know, the, what you, what you specifically do and some of the science involved that you, that you get down into when you, when you are working um, and using your techniques, or coaching some of these elite athletes, like the, like the, the HRV feedback and, and I just, I think that this is like, you know, that the, we could, you know, you talk about, you see everything that's happening right now with the, with the police and these shootings and, and these, this is a, this is a, a reaction and, and it's a reaction that is not necessary. You know, I, I, I always, I think that the way that the, the biggest reform that police need is this kind of training, this heart. Oh my God. Well, uh, I, I, <laughs> like th this would change change police culture. You could change it in a, in in a single year if you just start to institute this, so that the, when it, when they come up right. against these situations, they're not their hearts not going. They're adrenaline. You know what I mean? They're they they're literally cool as a cucumber, and they're just how many situations would be diffused if police uh, so walked you, up you, with you, that? You have no idea. You have no idea, and you're you're right on the money. At the beginning of COVID, I was developing a course called Responding from the Heart a first responder course. And I'd already basically run it through some trials with about um, three different fire departments. And um, we've seen it in police departments and the, it is so important if they could learn these skills, we would see a huge, huge decrease in all kinds of areas as far as emotional emotions getting out of control emotions not directed you know just uncontrolled emotional reaction ending up in all these situations it's, i mean yeah it's a sad well, situation and, and and the ptsd that comes with being a first responder you know sometimes these these men and women are going through situations that like for example a baby dying in their arms you know something that is emotionally traumatizing this PTSD this idea and the, and it's real like even from being raped I had PTSD and it first responder PS, PTSD you know those thoughts and those images may haunt them and having a tool having this tool can change that you know change their way of approaching their careers it's a great point Ali, it's a great point. And not only that, but I think that, you know, we're, we're, we seem to be hell bent on preventing things as a society. You know, I mean, we've seen, we've kind of reshaped our, our society in order to prevent things from happening. Um, and, and that's all fine and dandy, but if we're going to do that, then, then, then let's actually really take a look at what we can work to prevent because things like, PTSD and, and all the traumatic psychological damage that is done from, you know, we put our soldiers in these horrific situations over, you know, in the Middle East and these cities and they see some terrible things, you know, and one of the ways that we can help equip them to not come back here and be, end up on the street in New York City with a sign um, asking for a little bit of somebody to take care of them you know, it is to teach them how to, you know, keep an open heart in the face of that so that when the shit goes down, you know, all the snapshots that are taken and all this, you know, all the, the trauma that the brain begins to consolidate and, you know, kind of scratch the record starts to get really scratched, you know, something else will be going on in their mind, you know, and I don't know what that something else is, but I just know that there's got to be a better way to equip our, our people who we're putting out in these terrible situations, you know, and so, as far as the police goes, sometimes I don't think the situation is, is terrible. It's, you know, it's just that they have no idea how to respond to it physically. So, so Faust, you know, at, at, and I'm uh, not talking about the extreme, extreme cases, but in general, what is PTSD? What is depression? 
Depression is when we think the same sad thought over and over and over and over. What is anger problems? When I think the same hostile thought over and over and over and over. What is anxiety? What is an anxiety problem? When I think about something in the future or the past, I have no control over it. And I think about it over and over and over. It's repetition, like we were talking about at the beginning, that leads to all these problems. And at the deepest level, when you when that thought becomes the only reality you have, then you are in serious depression or serious suicidal tendencies when, because I can't get any relief from this thought. Well, you know, if we agree that that's the cause of the most of these issues, what would the solution be? Learning to think a thought over and over again, which leads me out of this, a thought of peace, a thought of forgiveness, a thought of love, you know, and to start really repeating. So the harmony exercise is full of these I am affirmations. And this is the secret to life is whatever you're, I don't care what John Denny or Ali Denny or Faust thinks. It's what each of our I am thinks. And this is where the belief is. And when, when I say I am this or I am that, and so each day in the harmony, we reprogram it. I am perfect health. I am perfect harmony. I am abundant supply. And I reprogram and renew my mind into those principles. They now have become my reality. And, you know, and, and that's extreme, you know, that's sort of the how it all works. But just like we were talking about before, at the simplest level, it's just thought repetition, which leads to success and failure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And they usually can find success through failure anyway, you know, that's the other side of it. But, um, you know, I, I, my nine-year-old comes in and your the meditations that you guys do are just kind of like the perfect length for and you know a nine-year-old who who and and he does so well with them and and i hear him do the effort and just to hear him say you know i am perfect health and i you know i it's it's um it's such a gift you know to to, to sit with him and and <laughs> and and listen to him do them and he he really enjoys them and and you know he's he he comes in and out with me and and it's it's just fantastic it's such a a gift i'm gonna like you know, the only reason why I hadn't been recommending it from here to, you know, um, Calcutta and back is, is because I didn't realize it was free, John. And I, and I, I'm always hesitant to be like, oh yeah, you know, you, you should check this out, but it's going to cost you, you know, but my God, like now that I know, and I'm sorry, I, I didn't realize it before I'm, you know, so, I'm, I am going to be shouting well, for people to go to this and we're going to include a link to the, to the website and everyone, you're going to be able to find this information in our thing, but that's so well, amazing. Faust, I really appreciate that. In the, the first year we did do a subscription based and we got, we got subscribers, but you know, you have to take care of subscribers and this and that. And we want a product that people use. If, if, if it makes a difference in your life, you know, you can, you can make a donation. We have donation buttons on the website. You can give a little money here or there, but, it, and, and, uh, but, but it's more important to us that people use it and get their lives better. And, you know, I, I have people who were, who were hundred dollar a year members who now have given me $250 for this year or, you know, so I, I was limiting my, the people who did want to give and I was shutting other people out. So forget it, you know, and I put too much work into it to not have it available for everybody. So yeah. screw it. If, if we, if we help people, they'll help us. If we're not <laughs> too <Yeah>. bad. <laughs> yeah. Um, it's, so that I'm so excited to do that now. God, I've been, I've been really like, how do I, you know, cause I'm in a few different groups from different retreats that I've been on and, you know, very like-minded people, um, people very concerned and who spend a lot, dedicate a lot of their lives to helping others, you know, and in a variety of ways, similar to what, you know, what you guys do by being you and by sharing your story like this. Um, it's, uh, it's, you know, 
uh, I, I'm sure we've, we've taken enough of your time, but just a little bit of what Ali and I are doing right now. Ali was given the head coaching job at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School, men and women's volleyball. And Marjorie Stoneman Douglas, there was a school shooting on Valentine's Day, February 2018, very recently. A matter of fact, our captain's sister was in the building when the shooting happened. So we walk past this building, which is surrounded by fences and plywood on the on the on the windows, windows. where the windows where the windows were shot out. And I mean, it's it's unbelievable because it's still evidence, and yet. We've been working with this team and we bring the computers and we teach them heart math and we've taught them our G7 warm up where we put the principles from Ho Ho Pono Pono and the harmony exercise. We've taught them a, a meditation, a little, you know, five minute version of the meditation. And this team has come together. And last year, I think they won one game the whole year. We've won five games. We're winning our division. The kids cannot wait to see Coach Allie the next day. And, we, and, you know, and we drive, each of us drives an hour each way to this practice, which, you know, she drives an hour from Miami. I drive an hour from Jupiter. We <laughs> arrive in Parkland for our hour and a half practice and then drive home. These kids have no idea, but we, we like, we really care and we're showing up and it's, and they're thriving. And it's another, it's going to end up being a wonderful success story, which, you know, hopefully we can tell about on your podcast next time yeah. we come on. Oh my God, absolutely. I mean, you guys, will, you, first of all, you're going to have to come back because just the time is flying by and, and there's so much to talk about. <laughs> we, I feel like we're, we're just getting into it, you know, and it's, but um, it, it's amazing. So, I mean, it, it makes a big difference in a, in a kid's life, you know, when you have a, when you have a coach or a teacher that cares, you know, and that it, I mean, you, you just, I mean, I can't imagine their parents when they come home and, you know, if they're like talking about you guys and, you know, I, I had like one, two teachers in my high school in all six years that, you know, really cared at all and were enthusiastic about me learning something, even if it was against, you know, what I thought was my, what I wanted. Um, and they, they changed the course of my life, you know, they they were patient with me and and i mean my one teacher gave me an opportunity to audition for the school play even though i missed the regular auditions she let me have a private audition because i was you know i was such a screw up i was in such a rebellion even even then you know a freshman in in high school uh and, and that's so it, funny that you say that because you know when i got the job Dad goes, okay, do you remember Coach Keenan? He's my high school coach. I go, well, yeah. He goes, do you remember Coach Costello? And I go, yeah, he's my middle school coach. And he goes, okay, you are that to these kids now. And I was like, oh, oh, <laughs> oh okay. You know, I'm this, I'm these kids' new mentor. I'm their friend. I'm their coach. I'm somebody that they can turn to that you know and i'm and i'm just meeting them granted i'm 23 some of, most of them are about 16 or 17 so mm -hmm. i'm not that much older than them and it's it is so fun the connection that i have with these kids because it's like they've become my friends too mm -hmm. you know like i care about them i want them to be successful like they're my first ever varsity team that i'm coaching and they're a bunch of 17 year old boys. <laughs> and, uh, Allie, so Allie, what, what did their parents tell you about how, how they've responded to us working with them? So one, one of our captains, actually, his parents came up to us and said, um, we want to say, th we want to thank you for teaching them the reset breath uh, because he, a lot of times will get I, I think they said distracted or bored almost in during a volleyball game or during an exam or during a school, a school session. And the reset breath has, and the heart math has helped him stay more present and stay more in the moment of enjoying what he's doing. And who knew that, you know, these kids were struggling with those things, but it's been really the impact that, 
we have had on them, it's been just as big that they've had on us. I'm sure they're, they're, they're incredibly lucky to have you guys both. I mean, I think the the impact that you're going to have on their lives is going to be long felt after they've stopped their volleyball playing. And I I mean, um, it's pretty amazing to to even um, think about and imagine. So it's incredible what you guys are doing. Um, John, I can't let you go without asking you, (laughs) because I'll get in trouble. What was the craziest day you had at Jaws or any other wave? So uh, I think my my crazy, I had a couple of crazy ones, um, two jump out in particular. One was a jet boat ride with Laird on the North shore of Kauai on a big day. And he decided he was gonna take us for a tour of sea caves. And now this tour of sea cave is usually done on a very calm day, but Laird is gonna take us into these caves with this you know 20 foot jet boat on a day where there's 15 20 foot waves in the ocean and we go into one cave and come back out and it was like wow that was really exciting and the next way the next cave is called the two door cave okay so there's an indoor and an outdoor i don't know anything about this but apparently we were going to go in the outdoor the first time round and i just remember we pull into the cave and all Laird says is, oh, shit, hang on. And, oh, man. And we look into the cave, and the whole cave is just one giant breaking wave. And he guns the boat, and the boat goes shooting up the wave and skewers the top of the cave and drops from about 10 feet straight down into the cave. And I, I land on the gunnel of the boat, break break a rib. Oh, my God. And, and I'm, I'm sitting there. I can't breathe very well. And he gets us out, and the boat has a huge hole in the front of it where he hit the top of the cave. Oh, my and God. And he's assessing the damage. And he's like, are you all right? I'm, I can barely be I'm like, yeah, I'm, I'm okay, I'm okay. And, and he looks at me and he sits back down and he goes, okay, we're going back in. And I'm like, <laughs> we're doing what? He goes, we're going back in. I'm like, back in the cave? And I'm like, I don't know if that sounds like a good idea, Laird. I and, can uh, barely breathe there. <laughs> <laughs> and, I guess he timed it a little differently the second time. And we went in the indoor and we make it out the outdoor and uh and that was yeah and and Laird was not much and you know we had other incredible experiences one of them was our last where uh we went out on a day which i believe i believe i saw a 100 foot wave this day but it was just three it was four of us on the water uh it was Laird and my friend Brett and our friend Sierra who actually he he committed suicide years later too um but we were out there on a day when it was raining and uh, Laird got towed into a wave, which was the biggest wave I've ever seen. Probably, you know, I, I think it was at least a hundred feet. It looked like anything I've ever seen in Nazare. And he ended up having to fall off. He jumped off his board. And when they made the rescue, the next wave hit them and actually put a, put the fin of the board through my friend's leg and cut him from his knee all the way to his ankle, all the way to the bone. And Laird stripped naked, tourniqueted at his leg, swam and got the jet ski. By the time we made it in to find them, he had already performed this rescue, got got bread on the ski and it basically saved his life and, and uh, drove him in and called the police. Well, we, we brought up all the boards and it was, uh, but talk about staying calm in the moment later on. And that, that story has been written about in surfers journal in Honolulu in the book, the wave Uh, it's been written about quite a bit, this story, but my wife always said, what do you think Laird was thinking? And I was like, I don't think he was thinking anything, (laughs) Barry. He was doing, he was what's next. And it was like staying calm in the midst of the most extreme danger where your friend is probably going to bleed to death. And it was, you know, when I really look back on that and, and, you know, and and is that trained? I don't know. I don't know if you can train that level of calmness, but I'll tell you, you know, 
I, I don't, you know, I think there's something inside those guys like Laird, which is just beyond anything. And uh, yeah, we, that was another day. The waves were so big and we go in and we take bread and the, the paramedics come and the lifeguards just, they can't even triage them because the, the injury is so gruesome. They don't even know what to do. Laird triages him, gets him in the thing. And we, and off he goes in the ambulance and, and Laird looks at us. He goes, okay, let's go back out. <laughs> Holy shit. Like, we don't even know if our friend's dead. And, and I it. was like, I was like, I can't do it, Laird. I was like, I can't, I can't go back out right now. And he's like, all right, well, and he, he and Sierra, the guy I was with on hopped on the skis and went back out there. It wow. was like, you know, getting back on the horse. Well, Laird, he did what he, he did everything he could, you know? So, right. I mean, and, and it was, it was probably the biggest waves we had ever seen on Maui ever. There was, it there, was, too, there was, it was no helicopters. Wow. There was, and it was too big for Jaws. Jaws, it was, it was, Jaws was just a giant closeout. And we went to this place called Pyramids, which is, which is a wave that doesn't even show itself unless it's 70 feet. It, you don't even see it until, wow. until it's 70 feet. And, and then, so, and then you see this thing start to show its face out there and it's, yeah, you know, it's just unbelievable. So tell people what Jaws is because they're going to they're going to be confused between the movie and what you're talking about, I think. So on the island of Maui, early on in the, in the late 90s and early 2000s, there was a very large wave and some people the, the locals called it Piahi, which is the beckoning, but but tourists and everyone else called it Jaws because it was the, the most dangerous wave anyone had ever seen. And it was the first real surfable wave of over 50 feet, 60, 50 feet on the face that was surfable. And it was the first one that they really started using the jet skis to pull into. They'd done a little bit of toe in surfing using uh, boats and, and Zodiacs and stuff over on Oahu. But when uh, the, the toe surfing world really started up in 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 earnest and they started using the jet skis jaws was sort of and still to this day is the the you know sort of the make it or break it wave in the giant waves as far as hawaii goes of course we have destination waves now in different places of the world but as far as hawaii goes jaws is still the the biggest wave that people surf and it and it's also a wave that breaks very close to the cliffs. So it's easy to be, a, you don't need a, you don't There's need no a beach. You don't need a helicopter There's to be a hero. You know, it's not breaking way out at sea somewhere. You can see it breaking right in front of you. So it's a very good spectator wave also. I think that's the one that I've seen all those videos on, on, on YouTube. Yes. I'm always like, where in God's name <laughs> <laughs> could this be taking place? Cause it's just such a spectacle and it's, so there and it's like how is this how is there room for you know it's hard to see from the angle that they can get the video from like how there's room for this godzilla size wave oh. you know to crash you know yeah and, and the, the, the videos make it a little not understandable because there is a big channel which you can go to where the wave does not break but uh when ali was about three in in about i guess it was about 1999 2000 uh, the BBC from Britain came out and did a documentary called Ride the Wild Surf. And it was a documentary made about Laird and Dave and all this exploration of the big waves. And for a subplot, they wanted Laird and Dave to teach someone how to do it. So they chose me to be <sighs> the greenhorn who goes out to Jaws and they tow me into the waves for the first time. And it really ended up being the the finale of the whole movie. Everybody's kind of jealous of me because I got to be the co-star <laughs> with Laird. But uh, yeah, and they take me and, you know, the final the final scenes of the movie is me surfing Jaws for the first time. And it nice. wasn't a very big day, but it was uh, it was exciting. Very cool. We'll have to I'll have to find that and include uh, first send, of all, watch uh, it, include a link to that in my uh, in the video. I'll send I'll send Hunter a link after this so he can cool. forward it on to you. At least uh, yeah, you can get off. <laughs> Jaws, man. It doesn't matter if it's a big day or not. It's fucking Jaws. <laughs> That's right. I was on that bluff watching that, like in January, February, you know, when it breaks. Yeah. 
people always call you when you're in Maui. They're like, it's breaking. And so I would have to like drive all the way from Kipahulu to fucking go see this wave. And it was, uh, it was worth it. Right. Oh, are you fucking kidding me, man? <laughs> I surf. So, I mean, to me, that's just like, it's like literally, you know, riding giants is one of my favorite movies. So it's like watching gods really. Yeah. So, like, uh, the Greek God, like, like Neptune, that kind of shit. It's crazy. Anyway, uh, thank you guys. That was fucking like such a good podcast. Thank yeah, you. we 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 we're, listen. We're gonna have to do it again. You know, for sure. It, because there's there's so much that I wanted to talk to you guys about, and and so much that we just kind of scratched the surface on. But I'm so grateful for your time. I know you both are are very very busy. Um, and so th- what a wonderful way to uh, spend a Sunday and and to catch you guys when you have a little bit of downtime and with everything that you're doing and you know before we before we go do you guys want to mention the harmony gratitude mastermind room is that something that that you guys wanted to bring up um at all like i, I don't want to leave anything well, only because that's where we met I, you know i don't know how many of your listeners know about this new clubhouse app which is similar to zoom but you don't have to have any videos just audio and um you know a year ago during COVID, we, deve- we, we started a family gratitude circle. And every day at 1230, there's a Zoom room that starts up. And we've had 30, 30 rooms open for, my, for different holidays. When we went through that suicide, it was a support group room. It's it just been an amazing thing. And we started a similar thing on Clubhouse, where we, we express gratitude Harm, and we talk about the harmony exercise, and then we employ the mastermind principle, each of us seeing each other's success for each other. And it's where we met and Hunter met, and we've just been having a fun time with it for the last six weeks. And, you know, wherever we can sort of take these principles and make people's lives better by using them is the trick that we want to do. And so people have been uh, resonating with that room very nicely. And just keep keep the message going out there. The more we can talk about love and gratitude, the better. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I was reading a quote by Carl Jung, um, and I thought I thought of um, Allie and and what she's overcome. And the quote is, "I am not what happened to me. I am what I choose to become." And it's certainly what you, what you've done, Allie, and and. Um, and you, John, and you guys are sharing what you know with everyone, and it's such a, a noble thing to do. And it's like it's it's what we're here for. So I'm grateful for having met you guys and and to become acquainted with you like this. Um, it's it's fantastic. So you know, if you have five minutes, until I'll, I'm going to ask you real quick. Tell me about any times that you may have been taken into the, a UFO and had experiments that were. <laughs> A lot of fun done on you when then you probably came back with this whole gratitude idea and had all these ideas you didn't even realize that it was them that gave it to you ah the little <laughs> the little trip to mount shasta yeah, yeah we've had a couple of those but uh you know that, that's funny i went to california and I, I visited carol's grave at the hollywood forever cemetery which is right there in the heart of hollywood and that day I had six coincidences between two and three miles on my GPS, which were absolutely unexplainable within 24 hours. Any one of them would have been a, would have been a a story you told the rest of your life. And I had five in 24 hours. I, I, I have the, I have the maps to prove them. And it was, it was literally, I was, I, I was on a, alien spaceship that day and i don't even know how it happened but it made me realize there is no division between life and death there is no way that outside forces were not directing my day that day and the more we can be in contact with those outside forces the more miraculous life gets absolutely man absolutely a uh I agree wholeheartedly. And you like basically just answered the other question that I didn't even have a chance to ask you with that answer. So perfect. Um, Ali, what about you? Come on, fess up. Where'd she go? <laughs> maybe we, maybe we dropped, she got, you know what? She probably didn't want to tell that story about that. You No, she, I'm just kidding. Ali, tell you a story. I don't know what happened to her. What happened to Tyler? Yeah. 
think we I think oh wait. Yeah, we lost her, yeah. She dropped. Well so what do we see? Maybe she ran out of battery. Oh yeah, could be. Yeah. Well, that's all right. when we when we get you guys on again, we're gonna have a whole segment dedicated. <laughs> okay, yeah. Well we can definitely go into aliens and all that, you know. Most of the stuff I read talks about our planetary experience. So yeah. we're only here for a low journey and driving along these vehicles, you know, like Laird says, you know, God makes a good car and we're enjoying this car ride for now and it'll be done. But I'll send you that uh, ride the wild surf links, at least to part five, and then you can discover parts one through six uh, on the internet. Okay. There. Very and, good. It sounds awesome, man. And um, thank you so much for your time, John. I appreciate it. Please give oh. my my best to Allie Teller. I'm so grateful that she came on with you. Um, so amazing to have such a amazing, <laughs> bright young woman on. Who, oh, she is. She's a know. rock star. Yeah, I just, you know, she's doing great things. And I want to make sure everybody knows about it. So thank you for helping her get her story out there, too. Absolutely, man. It's been it's been a pleasure. And uh, we'll be in touch. And thanks again. All right. Thanks, Faust. We'll Take talk care, to you. brother. We'll see you soon. I'll see you in the uh, in the cl in the clubhouse room. All right. Good deal. Cool.